Hey, you think you know how to beat Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire for the Game Boy Advance? Well, you don't. Actually, maybe you do. I don't know you. But have you ever followed any of the official guides that are officially licensed by Nintendo and played the game exactly how they told you to play it? Printed guides nowadays aren't as popular as they were in the early 2000s, largely because nowadays if you get stuck at any point in just about any video game, you can just pull out your phone and find a video on YouTube to help you out. So I have this guide on Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, officially licensed and endorsed by Nintendo. Front side is Ruby version, back side is Sapphire. I don't know about you guys, but I always prefer the backside, especially since Sapphire gets Lotad, which eventually becomes Ludicolo. If that's not peak Pokemon design, then I don't know what is. So we're gonna follow this guide exactly and see if this really is the best way to beat the game. We did this a little while ago with Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green and had a ton of fun, Although that was definitely not the most optimal way to beat the game as there were many mistakes in that guide. And of course this whole thing was inspired by this sick Minecraft video I saw about a month ago by somebody named Mystery Ore, which will be linked in the description like it was in the last one. This time we'll be hammering away at Pokemon Sapphire version thanks to this guide by Brady Games. A different company than the last time with a different author other than Eric. But hey, you still got that Nintendo seal. Now again, technically this isn't actually by Nintendo themselves, but it's close enough. Come me some slack, guys. Some people got annoyed by that in the last video like this, but Nintendo must have at least verified this guide somehow, right? Like somebody over there had to have at least skimmed through it. It's not like they would have just blindly put their seal on something that could contain something inappropriate. Like, if this guide had some Flannery fanfiction in there, would they really put their seal of approval on the- HOLY- <laughs> So now let's beat this game as Nintended. Get it? Nintended? Like, Nintendo? Intended? So many people made that joke in the last video, and I'm mad I didn't think of it first. You guys are all way funnier than me, and I would be nothing without the people who comment on my videos to give me this type of content. Alright, enough chatter. Let's load up a new save on Pokemon Sapphire. Starting off, I decided to play as Mei this time since I always pick the boy character in Pokemon games. I try and think of a more feminine way to spell my name since Pokimane didn't fit, so I named myself Sela, like C, which is my online alias, and then La at the end to make it more feminine. Aren't I so clever? I also picked this very colorful border that I've never seen before in this game because I think it's so hideous and kinda cool looking. I jump out the back of the truck, fix the clock in my room, and get the potion from the PC like the guide tells me to do. I eventually make it to the starter selection screen while trying to save Professor Birch, and just like in the Fire Red and Leaf Green guide, it tells me just to pick the starter that I like the most. One day I hope to find a guide that straight up tells me that one of the starters is bad and not to pick it, but I end up picking Trico this time since the picture of the guy chose Trico, so it must mean it's the best one, right? I name it Like, and you should totally like the video by the way if you're enjoying it. I do the typical rival shenanigans, and in Old Dale I notice a trainer tip that says, buy 10 items at once and get a free prize. I bought 10 potions and got no prize. The guide just scanned me. Now I know that the guide probably meant Pokeballs because in this game when you buy 10 Pokeballs you do get a special Pokeball. But since I'm going into this acting like I don't know that much about Pokemon as I know way too much about Pokemon, I did it anyway. And then I head to the other route next to Old Dale and I notice in the guide it actually tells me what Pokemon every single trainer has and what level they are, which is pretty cool. It doesn't tell me the types though, so I have to figure that out on my own, but I actually didn't expect this guide to be that in-depth, which is pretty cool. I do notice the first error on this page of the guide though, and under the notable Pokemon list for Route 102, it lists C-Dot and Rallus as the two most notable Pokemon. The first mistake is not listing Lotad as notable on this route, I caught one anyway and named it Ricky, and that it misspells Ralts to be Rallus. Overall, this guide seems to have a lot less errors than the last one about Fire Red and Leaf Green though. So this guide is by a company called Brady Games, right? And in the last video, somebody who said they used to work for Brady Games actually commented on the video saying that they were often rushed with these guides to meet tight deadlines, which is understandable to have some mistakes. I also noticed that my Lotad only has one move in Astonish right now, which doesn't do anything to the Zigzagoons, which are very common at this stage of the game. So I go to the back of the guide to check if it has Lotad's level up moveset, like the guide about Fire Red and Leaf Green did, but unfortunately it doesn't have that. While looking for it though, I noticed that I actually cut out the berry page for this guide too, like I did with the guide in Fire Red and Leaf Green. I have no idea why I was so fixated on berries as a kid, and why I cut these pages out. I made it to Petalburg anyway, and the first thing the guide tells us to do is to stop by our father's gym to help Wally catch a Pokemon, then we have to go and talk to this random person in the Pokemon Center and enter a short phrase. 
The guide alludes to the idea that there's some sort of special combination for this, but doesn't tell me what it is, so this was just pointless. Now we have to head into the Pedalberg Woods and save this Devon researcher from Team Aqua, which was pretty easy. I collect some hidden items along the way and stop in the flower shop on Route 104 to get the Wilmer Pale and some berries like the guide suggests. I make it on my way to Rustboro City and the first thing the guide wants me to do is go to the second floor of the Devon Corporation Tower to get a Premier Ball from this random NPC. Turns out I can't actually go to the second floor of this building yet, and it also turns out that the building the guide was talking about was actually the apartment building not the Devon building. I get the Premier Ball anyway and also stop by the Cutter's house to get the HM for cut, stop by the school for a quick claw item, and now the guide wants us to battle Roxanne, the first gym leader. The guide really doesn't say much about it other than to use grass and water types, but since I have two grass types, this gym goes by pretty smoothly, although the nose pass was actually a lot tankier than I expected. I then head east and save Mr. Brownie and the Devon Corporation guy pretty easily, and along the way I catch the Zigzagoon for two reasons. The first reason is because I need an HM slave, and the second reason is because of this. I head back to the route south of Rustboro City to get in this one double battle here, and I lead with my newly evolved Grovile and the newly caught Zigzagoon, and because they both have nicknames, the game goes, go, like, and subscribe when I send them out. I thought that was much more funnier than it probably actually is, since I like to subtly remind people to like or subscribe in my videos if I end up doing them at all. Somebody in the comments of the last video actually got really mad at me saying I was begging for likes and subs too much by naming my Bulbasaur subscribe, but would you rather me do this and pull out this chart and talk about the analytics? Would you? Would you really? Or would you prefer the subtle messages? Yeah, I thought so. I head back to Mr. Brownie's cabin near Petalburg after saving him and he takes us to Duford City where we can deliver a message to Steven in the cave and collect the second gym badge from Brawly. The first thing I do in Duford is get the Sylph Scarf from this woman, like the guy says, get the old rod, and then collect the second gym badge. The guy recommends that I use a flying type Pokemon, but I don't have any yet, and I haven't even ran into any at this point. It strictly tells me not to use normal types, so big surprise, Zigzagoon is hitting this one out. I enter the gym, beat all the trainers pretty easily, and notice that I'm at a pretty good level since the guy says that Brawly's Pokemon are level 17 and 18. I challenge him, and I lost. I try again, and I lost again. This time I go back into the nearby cave to grind a little bit and eventually run into an Abra. I catch one since Psychic is super effective against fighting like the back of the guide says, so I thought it would be a pretty good help since the only other flying option I had was Zubat which really isn't that cool of a Pokemon. Turns out that Abra only has Teleport though, so I spend some time switch training it just to realize that it won't learn any level up moves until it evolves. So I just level up my other Pokemon, go into it with Grovile and my newly evolved Lombre, and this time I'm able to dispatch Brawly and get the second gym badge. I also get the TM for bulk up from Brawly, and the guy has a pretty funny excerpt on the move. It says, TM08, bulk up, is a nice move that raises attack and defense at the same time. Outside this dual attack plus effect techniques, this is a pretty unique ability. Remember that your attack techniques must be regular types instead of special types to benefit from this and you must be defending against regular types, not special types. If you bulk up and use a special attack to try to defend against a special attack, you won't be a very happy trainer. Your opponent might be, though. So that's a little confusing, but by standard attacks, I'm guessing it means physical attacks. And that last part about your opponent being happy actually made me laugh out loud when I read it. Now I head into the Granite Cape to find Steven after getting the second gym badge and also get Flash. This guy actually tells me where to get Flash, which is pretty nice. As a kid, I remember missing Flash in this game as well, since unless you talk to the hiker at the start of the cave, you won't know how to get it. The guide has another weird excerpt this time about the Everstone, which is an item you can find in the cave. It says, The Everstone is a convenience item that prevents Pokemon from evolving when it's equipped. This is nice when you're dealing with a Pokemon that will learn only certain moves in a less evolved form. You can avoid the hassle of having to prevent their evolution continuously by simply equipping the Everstone until the Pokemon has learned the moves you want, then remove it to allow evolution. Consider it a useful trainer's tool. You could also just press the B button, but that's besides the point. After completing everything we have to do in Dooford, I head back to Mr. Brownie's boat and head on over to Slateport City. After defeating all the trainers on the beach, I head into the shipyard to find Captain Stern, but I'm told that I have to go into the museum now, which was previously occupied by Team Aqua. I head in, where I am forced to pay even though the whole museum is still being overtaken by Team Aqua members, and I talk to this grunt to get the TM for Thief, which the guide calls appropriate, which I agree with. I head upstairs to see Captain Stern and I have to battle two Aqua Grunts first. The guide tells me that the Grunts both have Nummels, but they actually both have Carvanas instead. 
The guide writer must have been playing Pokemon Ruby for this guide, and even though the guide says it's for Ruby and Sapphire, it definitely favors Ruby more as it doesn't list what Pokemon the Aqua Grunts have. Luckily, I defeat the Grunts anyway because I have two Grass types, explore the city a bit like the guide suggests, and I have to head north to Route 110. I also start to notice that my Zigzagoon keeps picking up items because of its ability, like full restores and revives. Even though I don't plan on using it in battle at all, it makes it worth keeping on my team for now. I run into the grass on Route 110 and run into the Electric-type Pokemon, Electric, and decide to catch it and name it Eric. If you saw the last video like this, then you know why, but also getting more type diversity on my team is pretty good, since the only two usable Pokemon I really have on my team so far are both grass types. I pass by the Trick House because the guide tells me to skip it for now since I don't have the HM for Strength yet and you need it to fully explore the Trick House, although you could technically explore it a little bit without Strength. I battle all the trainers on this route to level up my Electric a little bit more and come across the first rival battle where my rival has more than just their starter Pokemon. The guide tells me that Brendan will have his starter Pokemon in the middle evolution form, a Whalmer, and a Nummel. Seeing two fire types on my rival's team makes me a little bit nervous, but once he sends out his final Pokemon, it turns out to be a Shroomish and not a Nummel, meaning that this should be a variable Pokemon as well, depending on which starter your rival has. I hammer away at him anyway and get the victory pretty easily, and also discover that Lombre's nature power attack is actually quite useful, as it turns into a different attack depending on what the area is. For example, in this grassy area, it was swift. I make my way to Mauville City, get the HM for Rock Smash, an Acro Bike, and I quickly backtrack to Slateport City through the cycling road to get the Harbor Mail in order to exchange it for the coin case. The guide tells me to go into the Pokemon Center and talk to this NPC about exchanging records with other human players, which you could do by connecting up with the link cable. Since I have no other human players to connect with, as I am also totally playing this on an actual console if you're watching Nintendo, I can't do that. I then battle Wally in his level 16 routes in front of the gym, which only goes for double teams and then dies rather quickly. I head into the game corner and notice the guide says, yup, it's back in Ruby and Sapphire and I can definitely confirm, the game corner is definitely here. I talk to the person to get the Mudkip doll like the guide says I'll get, but I actually get a Trico doll instead. I'm guessing this is because it matches your starter Pokemon and whoever made this guide picked a Mudkip. Now we have to take on Watson, the leader of the electric type gym. The guide suggests that I use ground or rock Pokemon for an easy victory, so I check my bag to see if I have any rock moves, knowing that rock moves won't help anyway, and teach rock tune to my Grovile. I also taught it Rock Smash for more type diversity so we have another different move, and after going for Rock Tomb on a Magnemite and seeing it do basically no damage, I start to just use Rock Smash instead since it does more damage and can lower defenses. I did manage to beat the gym on my first attempt, but it was more difficult than I expected since my team really isn't good against electric and steel type Pokemon. I get the badge and the TM for Shockwave, which the guide suggests I teach to an electric type Pokemon or a non-electric type Pokemon for more move diversity. I notice that Shockwave is slightly worse than Spark, so I don't teach it to Electric, but it can be taught to Sabrina the Abra, so I hold on to it in case we decide to use Abra in the future. Now I head up north, and the guide wants us to take on the Windstraight family, even though this is technically optional like the Trick House was, which we passed not too long ago. It then encourages me to get into this specific double battle with the reporters, who interview at the end, so I just say LOL since I was surprised it was even an option. I run into a Sandshrew, and since I have an Electric-type Pokemon this time around, unlike in the Fire Red and Leaf Green video, I do what the Fire Red guy told us to do and use an Electric move on a Ground-type. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't work. I also eventually notice that the interview I had with those reporters after that double battles actually gets shown on TV, which is a pretty funny thing that this game does. I make my way to the Fiery Path to get through Fall Arbor Town now, battle just about every single trainer on the way, catch a Nubble and aim at Becky for more type diversity since we don't have any fire types yet, and make it to the other side of Route 112. I get the TM for Secret Power so we can make a secret base if we really wanted to, but the guy suggests that we wait and don't bother with it just now until we get more money to decorate our secret base later on. I finally make it to Fall Over Town, and there's a lot we have to do in the surrounding area. I talk to Lynette in the Pokemon Center, get the TM for Roar from this guy, and try and enter the Move Trainer's house since the guy tells me I can teach my Pokemon any move, but unfortunately I can't actually do that because I don't have a hard scale yet. I stop by the Fossil Maniac's house to pick up Dig as well, then head south. I head to Lynette's house on this route, and the guy tells me I'll get a Dot doll from playing Ruby, and a Lotad doll for playing Sapphire. This is one of the few instances where the guide actually recognizes the difference between versions, 
which makes me wonder how they realized this difference and not any of the other previous difference that they just neglected. I head into Meteor Falls where I walk in on Team Aqua and Team Magma arguing over meteorites. They run off and I save Professor Cosmo who was here as well. I totally forgot this guy even existed. The guy takes me on an interesting route here and does some things I don't normally do while playing through this game, as it tells me to exit on the other side of Meteor Falls onto Route 115, which is north of Rustboro City. I trek all the way through Rustboro, then through the Rust Turf Tunnel, and head into Verdant Turf Town for the very first time, although we technically could have gotten here way sooner. I get the contest passed here so we can do contests if we really want to, I really don't want to do contest, and also pick up the TM for Attract, which is great foreshadowing for some events to come. I pass by the daycare center as well with the intent of dropping off my Abra or some other Pokemon to gain some levels, but the guy doesn't say anything about Pokemon in the daycare gaining levels, so I just put Abra in the PC. The guide only tells me that the daycare is for breeding and it hints at the idea of some egg moves. Now I finally head into Mount Chimney to fight Team Aqua and their leader, Archie. The guide tells me that Archie has a level 24 Mightyena, a level 24 Golbat, and a level 25 Camerupt. I go in there rather recklessly in the first attempt and don't even bother to heal so I lose pretty easily, but the second time I play more cautiously and save my Electric for his Golbat which I took down pretty easily. All that's left now is his Camerupt, and wow, big surprise, it's not a Camerupt, it's actually a Sharpedo. Sharpedo goes down pretty easily thanks to my grass types, and now we can head south into Lavridge Town and start getting the next few gym badges rather quickly. I get the egg in this town and explore quite a bit like the guy tells me to do, but now I have to take on Flannery and get the fourth gym badge. This is one of the gyms that I remember the most from when I was a kid first playing through Pokemon Ruby, so this should be fun. The guide doesn't give me a proper path to take to get to Flannery in her gym, so I struggle a bit as her gym is kind of similar to Sabrina's from Fire Red and Leaf Green. I finally make it into her room to battle her, but the guide doesn't tell me anything about which types of attacks I should use, which is rather unfortunate, but I know that my Numble has Magnitude now, which can hit her whole team super effective as they are all fire types. I take out the two Slugmas that she has pretty easily, and now it's all up to Torkoal. I try to go for Growl to lower its attack a little bit since its body slam was pretty annoying, but it has an ability that prevents Snat Drop so that backfired. My Numble eventually falls, so I shuffle between my remaining Pokemon and my Grovile actually gets hit with an Attract from the Torkoal, resulting in a loss. I train up a little bit against some nearby trainers that I skipped, and head back into the gym with some revives this time, and managed to revive my Numbel enough times and get some lucky magnitude hits to knock out the Torkoal. The type diversity on my team really isn't doing us any favors, but we're kind of making it work. I step out the gym, and to directly quote the guide, it says, and after you leave the gym, you get the Go Goggles. How? Your rival will stop to congratulate you and suggest that you visit your father in the Petalburg gym to challenge him. I thought this was pretty funny because it doesn't say anything about my rival actually giving me the goggles, although he actually does. Now I make the long trek back all the way to Petalburg for the fifth gym badge against Norman. The guy tells me nothing useful about the gym, so I just blindly head in with the team that I have, roughly the same level as they were when I battled Flannery. I get to Norman, and he is actually one of the hardest gym battles in Pokemon that people don't really talk about too often. While slacking is pretty bad competitively, Norman has two of them on his team and they can be a pain to deal with. Big surprise, I lose my first attempt for like the fourth important battle in a row now, but luckily my Grovia learned Leaf Blade now, so I have a much stronger grass move to use as Absorb was rather weak, and after playing it a bit risky by thunder waving his Pokemon that know the move Facade, Grovia is able to clean this one up. I got pretty lucky because Slacking had to loaf around half the time, and sometimes he got full parried, meaning he wouldn't attack for like three turns in a row sometimes. I head next door to the gym to get the HM first surf and teach it to Lombre so we can finally have a water type move on our team, which would have been so useful against Flannery's gym. And now I have to trek all the way back to Mauville in order to get to Route 118 and head to the next town. I stop by these two interviewers again for the double battle, and after the battle they interview me and I just said, oi 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 because it was the most random thing I can find. And then we have this small run-in with Steven that the guide makes no mention of whatsoever for some reason. The only real things to note between here and Fortree is the Weather Institute and another rival battle. I get through both pretty easily, pick up the cast form, and take the mystic water it was holding and give it to Lombre so I can power up my water moves, and also notice that the guide messed up my rival's team again since it missed the Shroomish again. Electric also evolved into Manectric somewhere in there, which helps us out a lot since Manectric's actually pretty strong. 
Now that we are in Fortree City, the guide wants us to take on the 5th gym. Wait, 5th gym? Well, actually it's the 6th gym, but since the entrance is blocked, we have to head all the way over to Route 120 to get the Devon scope from Steven so we can head into what is actually the 6th gym. This time the guide actually tells me which types of Pokemon to use against Winona and her gym, saying I should bring Electric to zap them, Rock to bash them, rather gruesome there, and Ice to freeze them. Since I have my newly evolved Manectric, this is one of the easiest gym battles we've had yet. And now we also have the ability to use the HM for Fly outside of battle, which is very convenient. I catch a Pelipper and name it Fly just because I need something that can use Fly. And the egg I got also hatched into Why Not during this time, which I immediately threw into the PC. I now take the long walk south, as the guide puts it after defeating Winona, thinking that we are going to Lily Cove City next, but the guide takes me on quite the detour before we actually head into Lily Cove. First, we get to the Safari Zone, which it lists as optional, so I check the back of the guide where it has all the optional areas, and it says there are no notable Pokemon found in the Safari Zone. I did want to catch some new Pokemon around this time, and I thought the Safari Zone would be a good opportunity for that, but if the guide says there's no notable Pokemon, then why even bother? Instead of heading straight into Lily Cove, which is very close by from the Safari Zone, the guide tells us to go south onto Route 122, defeat Team Aqua and Mount Pyre, where they get the Grunts teams wrong yet again, and explore Route 123 where the Berry Master's house is. Then we have to fly back to Slateport City since Team Aqua is over there now at the shipyard, and they try to steal a submarine and they head to Lily Cove City. Now we have to head to Lily Cove City, but the guy never told us to go there when we were so close to it, meaning we can't fly there, so we have to fly to Fortree and then walk all the way back towards Lily Cove. Now that we're in Lily Cove, there's quite a few things we can do here. The thing the guy that tells us to do first though is to pick up this Max Repel right here, which really isn't too important. Then we have another rival battle in front of the department store this time where they forget about Shroomish yet again. Now we have to check out the Lily Cove Harbor despite there not being anything there for us, as well as some other minor things we have to visit like the department store. Unfortunately, you can't buy a water stone in this department store, so we're still stuck with Lombre for now. Next, we head into the enemy team base, although it doesn't specifically tell me where it is or mark it on the map, even though the picture of the map that the guide shows, shows the entrance in the corner. I was able to defeat all the guns pretty easily since my Pokemon actually match up pretty well against most of Team Aqua's Pokemon, just don't match up well against a lot of other Pokemon. And I also get the Master Ball, which the guide suggests I use for a one-of-a-kind Pokemon that's hard to catch. I remember as a kid, I actually used my Master Ball on a wild Ponyta I ran into because I wanted to clean the Pokedex, I didn't have a Ponyta, and I had no other Pokeballs, and that was quite the waste. Now one interesting note about this Team Aqua base though, is that it actually mentions how the final Grunt has a Camerupt in Ruby and a Sharpedo in Sapphire, which was correct. I guess the guide writer finally realized there was actually a difference between versions and what each evil team had on their team, but they just didn't bother to go back and fix it at any other point in the game, where it says that a lot of the Team Aqua Grunts have Numbles or Camera Ups, which they obviously don't. Now I surf east towards Moss Deep City and notice the guide mentioned the Treasure Hunter's house where I can exchange a blue shard for a water stone, which I really really want for my Lombre to evolve into Ludicolo. Unfortunately, I don't have a blue shard yet, and the guide doesn't specifically tell me where I can find one, it just says they're on this route. So I have to wait for my Ludicolo for now. I did collect some of the other items the guide suggested I pick up once I reach Moss Deep, and now we have to take on the 7th gym led by Tate and Liza. The guide makes no mention of types yet again, and only has a couple of sentences about this gym, despite it being the first double battle gym in Pokemon history, and the most unique gym in the entire region. Since Tate and Liza have one Pokemon each, both of which happen to be Rock-type, I beat them with two shakes of a lamb's tail. Now the guide wants us to head south and find another Team Aqua hideout underwater, which we need to use Dive for, so unfortunately I had to get rid of Nature Power on Lombre to teach it Dive. This time, for the last two trainers you fight here, being the admin and the evil team leader, this time for the last two trainers you fight in the hideout, being the admin and the evil team leader, the guide actually tells me that the camera up each of them have is exclusive to Ruby version, but doesn't tell me what the Sapphire exclusive counterpart is, although I know by now it's Sharpedo. I beat them both pretty easily yet again, see Kyogre fly out of that cave, and now we have to head all the way over to Sutopolis City where we can get the 8th and final gym badge. The guide suggests I explore the underwater to find some cool items like the blue shard, and I explore it quite a bit but can't find any still. 
I finally make it to Citopolis City, and the first thing the guy tells us to do is to go to the Cave of Origin where Kyogre is hiding to calm it down. I go in there, and I just catch it right away with my Master Ball and name it Shrek since that's the most appropriate name I could possibly think of for a Kyogre, and now we are ready to take on Wallace and the final gym. The guide only mentions that the gym has an assortment of ice Pokemon, and looking at the list of Pokemon the guide shows that can be found in this gym, there's a whopping one singular ice-type Pokemon in this entire gym, including the trainers before the gym leader, being Wallace's Celio. This is more of a water gym, if anything, and since the only three usable Pokemon on my team are grass or electric type, this goes by very smoothly. We did struggle a little bit in pretty much every single gym between Brawly and Norman, but luckily we were able to close out the final few gyms pretty easily. Now we have to head over to Evergrande City, where I teach my Kyogre Waterfall to make it there. All that's left for us now is Victory Road, the Elite Four, becoming the champion, and most likely some grinding session in between there since my Pokemon are all quite a bit underleveled, which really isn't helping us. Headed into Victory Road was simple enough as the guide actually has a pretty good map that shows me where each ladder leads to, making me be able to follow it pretty easily, although I did have to go back out and get my Abra for Flash. At the end, we have a fight against our rival Wally, which is one of my favorite rival fights in the entire Pokemon series. Wally has a pretty cool team all around with some Pokemon that I really, really like from Generation 3, like Altaria and Gardevoir, but I'm able to take him down pretty easily, and now it's time to head into the Elite Four. I level up my team quite a bit since I see that the Elite Four has Pokemon that are mostly in the mid-50s, so I level up all my Pokemon to be around level 50, including this Pelipper that I named Fly that I was only using for Fly. Numble eventually evolves into Camerupt, I teach my Pokemon a couple of new moves here and there, and have to deal with not using Ludicolo this playthrough since I can't find a Water Stone to evolve my Lombre, even though the whole point I picked Sapphire was so I can use a Ludicolo, and Ludicolo was also the reason why I chose Sapphire version when I streamed a Pokemon Sapphire and Nuzlocke about a year ago, and I didn't get Ludicolo in that run either. The guide again doesn't suggest any specific types or level for my Pokemon when heading into the Elite Four, so I just walk in to fight Sydney, realize I forgot to stock up on potions and revive which I will definitely need, so I lose after his shift tree goes for a million double teams, which was quite annoying. I stuck up on items this time around and head right back in, and decide to leave with Sceptile. It goes pretty smoothly, although I notice that Sydney sends out a level 48 Sharpedo, although the guide makes no mention of him having a Sharpedo. This guide must really not like Sharpedo for some reason, since just about every trainer who has a Sharpedo in this game, the guide doesn't mention them having a Sharpedo. I'm able to do a lot of damage with Sceptile and Camera up to Sydney's team though, and now it's on to Phoebe. I leave with the Sceptile yet again, but eventually switch over to Kyogre to finish this out. My Kyogre is a few levels below the rest of my team, but it's so strong that it doesn't even matter thanks to all the rain boosted water type moves. This allows me to go through Phoebe rather easily, and now we head into the fight against Glacia. I thought I would struggle against her a little bit more since her ice type Pokemon match up pretty well against my team in general, and I can't really hit ice types too strong. I start with Manectric and get a knockout until it falls eventually, then use Sceptile for the middle part of the fight again, and finally finish her off with Kyogre again, and if you're noticing, there's kind of a trend of me starting with Sceptile, using Manectric, and then finishing with Kyogre. Now we have to fight Drake, and since I'm so close to finishing this game and just want to get it done as soon as possible since I've been working on this video for so long, I don't even mess around at all and I just leave with Kyogre and Ice Beam everything as it hits everything super effective, taking very minimal damage making this the easiest fight yet. As a kid I remember struggling against Drake a lot, so this is my revenge. And now we have the champion, Steven, and his Steel-type team, although half of his team isn't even Steel-type. The guy just tells me that he can be difficult to beat, but if we do defeat him, we beat the game, so thanks guide. I leave with Manectric to start off and knock out his Skarmory, although his Skarmory goes for spikes, which kind of scare me a little bit. I use just about every single member on my team for this fight, and finish off with Kyogre yet again, who does way more damage than it should thanks to the rain, and now we are finally the champion. We beat Pokemon Sapphire as Nintendo intended, well, sort of. Overall, this was a pretty fun playthrough for me, but it made me realize that it can be hard to get a diverse team when playing through these games. Last time I played through Sapphire was about a year ago, and although that run was a Nuzlocke, I ran into a very similar issue as we did this time, where my team didn't have that much type diversity, as back then my team was pretty much all water type. I did struggle in this run more than I expected though, even though I have played through these games so many times in the past. 
In terms of the guide though by Brady Games, it has less mistakes overall compared to the Fire Red guide, and I did like how it listed every single trainer Pokemon, although some were incorrect, most notably with Team Aqua's Pokemon. The guide itself was pretty good overall, especially when it comes to a lot of the post-game content and optional areas, which we didn't cover in this video as our objective was just to simply beat the game by becoming the champion of the Hoenn region. I would have liked it if it showed more of a level up moveset for a lot of Pokemon like the Fire Red Guide did, and a way to evolve a lot of the Pokemon, again like the Fire Red Guide did, but that would require a lot of work, and again I'm assuming that whoever wrote this guide had a very tight constraint when writing it, so it can be forgiven. I do plan on making more videos like this since they are a lot of fun, and the last one was very well received, so thank you guys for supporting that, so be on the lookout for that. I also upload other Pokemon videos that are different than these type of runs, be sure to check those out as well, as if you enjoy this, I'm sure you'll like those as well. And with all that being said, thank you all so much for watching, have a great rest of your day, I'll see you all next time, and bye bye.